Oftentimes, um, philosophers, sociologists, other people in the social sciences will talk about the difference between fact versus value. Right? And they will stress that with facts, how can you tell if they're true or false? Think about really simple facts, like this is full of coffee. Look at it. Yeah, you can look at it. Although, you know, in the case of it being coffee, just looking at it, yeah, that might satisfy you. Yeah, I mean, it could also be um, Kahlua, right? Could be, you know, drinking on the job. Um, I wouldn't be the first professor to ever do that in, in, uh, in life. Um, yeah, you wouldn't know until you actually test it with some sort of means that corresponds to that fact. There are some facts you can, you can tell just by looking. Are, how many students are in the classroom? I could count you up. I haven't done that, and I'm not going to do it right, right this second, but I can tell that by looking. If I doubt whether somebody is really there, maybe, you know, they're a great you know, sci-fi tech whiz, and they've created a hologram so they can sit in class and get credit for class, I can maybe, you know, touch them and see whether my hand goes through them. I won't do that to you because, you know, not because I'm not crediting you for being smart, but I think you, you wouldn't like that, and that would take a lot of class time. Um, so facts are, are things that we generally think we can agree on, right? We can appeal to our senses. <clears throat> there may be some facts that uh, you can't directly verify today. Like um, John Kennedy was assassinated. Uh, where was he assassinated? Anyone remember? During a parade. Yeah. Where? Oh, you're thinking of uh, Lincoln. Lincoln was assassinated too, yeah. Now, how would you verify facts like these? Um, well, you can't do it directly, but you know we rely on historians. And those historians ultimately are relying on something that people supposedly you know, saw. These are, these are public, right? Now, when it comes to value judgments, a lot of people will say, well, you can never really be sure about value judgments. What do we mean by value judgments? Um, this is a good book. This is a bad book. Um, actually, as far as this textbook goes, my estimation of it is it's not good, but it's not totally bad. I've never seen a textbook that I would say, oh, this is, this is great, because I don't think those, those actually exist. Um, but it's, you know, it's not totally bad. There are some things in it that are good. There are some things that are misleading, and I point those out to you, right, so that you don't get, get confused. Um, but that's a value judgment. You might disagree with me on that, right? Um, how many of you have spent a lot of time with, I won't ask how many of you have spent a lot of time with the textbook. I'll credit all of you with having done that. How many of you think it's a, it's a really good textbook compared to some of the other ones you have? A well, few people, right? Um, how many of you think it's a terrible textbook? Well, nobody thinks it's awful? Okay. How many of you say, eh? Yeah. That's a value judgment, by the way, right? It's not expressed as a statement. But it is making a value judgment. Eh. Eh, you know, it's okay. Um, somebody hands you a hamburger from a fast food joint, you take a bite, and uh, unless you're really, really hungry, you don't usually go, oh my god, this is the best hamburger I've ever had in my life. The way you would when it's right off the grill, you know, in a backyard barbecue. Um, but, you know, you don't say, oh, this, is, this, is, this tastes awful. Eh. That's a value judgment. And we disagree about value judgments, just like we do disagree about facts. But we often think that we can't meaningfully disagree about value judgments. You've got your values, I've got mine. You know, we're just, we just maybe are born with them, or we get them from our environment, and we can't meaningfully argue about them. So today, what I'm going to say to you, and this is what I'd really like you to carry from this class, is yes, you can argue about value judgments and you have to argue about value judgments. If you want to be a decent person, you cannot go through your life without confronting other people about their value judgments and examining your own value judgments and seeing whether you have good grounds for believing them. These are both 
statements, which means that they are what? Claims. Claims, right. And the same basic thing happens when somebody makes a claim and we disagree with it, we can ask them for an argument. So it doesn't matter whether it's a fact statement, you know, the cup is full of coffee, prove it, uh, or if it's a value statement. We may not be able to come to agreement, but that's a very different issue about whether we can have arguments, whether we can make claims. Um, a lot of people confuse these two issues. One issue is whether we can make claims about values. The other is whether we can get everybody to agree. Those are not the same issue at all. And a lot of people screw up their lives by confusing those two issues. Um, because you can't actually find arguments that you will find convincing one way or the other about values. Part of your growth as a student, and then part of your growth as a human being for the rest of your life, is in fact sometimes changing your mind about values. You know, um, everybody who has gone, you know, we have a few older students, the older students can tell you, as you, as you get older, as you acquire more experience, you acquire new perspectives on things, and your values change. When you have a kid, provided you're not a terrible parent, um, that changes your values as well. It reorients them. Um, so, we'll come back to this issue about agreement and disagreement. Another thing that I want to talk about that I think you'll find useful, your book really distinguishes between two different kinds of value judgment, and that's because it places them along a scale. And your book talks about what we can call aesthetic value judgments. And that's on one extreme, right? And then on the other side, we have moral value judgments. Um, now, there's, there's other things in between. I add an, another category that your book touches on a little bit, but doesn't really define that carefully in what we can call practical. Um, and if this was an ethics class, practical, then we might distinguish a few more, but I want to keep it fairly simple. Um, and I want you to see the differences between these. So, aesthetic, when you hear that term, how many of you know what that term means? Right off the bat. A few, okay. So when you hear that term, what do you associate that with? Taste. Taste. Appealing to a person. Appealing to a person. Looks. Looks. Okay, those are all very good. Um, my, my mother actually was a secretary most of her working life, and one of her jobs was to work at a, a place that was called the School of Aesthetics and Cosmetology. And uh, what that meant was hairdressing and makeup school. Because, you know, aesthetics is about looks. It's about what makes things pleasing. But it encompasses more than just what appeals to the eyes. Um, whether this coffee is, is tasty or not, that's a matter of aesthetics. Um, when you listen to music, all of you, I'm sure, enjoy some music and dislike some other music, right? And there are probably a lot of different reasons. If you are called upon to explain why you like listening to this group and you don't like this other group that seems pretty similar to them, you would have some reasons that you could get. All of those are matters of taste, or appreciation, or feeling. So, you know, let's think for a moment, before we go to the other extreme, what does this encompass? So, music, right? Clearly it involves that. Um, what about, um, go ahead. People. People, yeah. You can say that somebody is aesthetically pleasing or not. Um, some people are more attractive, other people are less attractive. Um, and you can change that too. I mean, that, that whole idea behind that school of aesthetics and cosmetology, what's the point behind makeup? It takes people who are at one level, and then if, they, if it's put on right, I mean, if it's put on wrong, it makes it worse, doesn't it? But if it's put on right, it makes things, makes people more attractive. Or sometimes it's used just not to not make them look old. You know, like newscasters, when they're on stage, 
they have makeup on. Right? Um, HDTV has kind of um, interfered with that, hasn't it? Now you can see all the cracks in people's face. And that's not pleasing, is it? We have certain things that as human beings, we don't you know, fully agree on them, but there are certain basics that you can appeal to. For uh, attractiveness of face, do you know what one of the most important characteristics is? Other than you know, having two eyes, a nose, you know, all that sort of stuff. What's that? Teeth. Yeah, you know, um, that's important. Having them um, to begin with, uh, the whiteness of them. That's why you see so many commercials for whitening your teeth. Um, it's actually symmetry. When they, when they test people to find out who they think are attractive, it turns out that on average, um, most people find people whose, whose left side is very similar to their right side attractive. Yeah. I mean, psychologists can tell us a lot of interesting things about human behavior this way. Um, and if you actually want to see whether your face is symmetrical or not, you can get a special mirror. And, and you'll find out probably your face is not perfectly symmetrical. Your right side looks different than your left side. And if your right side looks, you know, very close to your left side, you're probably going to be rated as more attractive. Then there's other features, you know, but we disagree about them too, don't we? You ever got into an argument about who's attractive and who's not attractive? Yeah. That's because um, these are matters of taste. Those are personal. There's some cultural parts to this, right? Um, there are, there are things that are seen as attractive here because of our culture. Uh, for instance, in our culture, for, say, a 20-year-old woman, better to, be, uh, better to be heavy or thin? Thin, right. What about in Egypt? It's the opposite. If you're thin, there's something wrong with you. Nobody wants to marry you. So some of these things can be culturally influenced. Um, and it, actually, if you look at the artwork from uh, different time periods, we don't know this so much with men because artists, you know, tended to like to paint you know, women a lot more, and most of the artists were men. But you can see different body types over time. That's what they liked. They didn't all like, you know, so when you look at a medieval painting and you're like, man, she doesn't look very good at all, you are coming to a different judgment about taste than they have. Um, they had a different what we call a different aesthetic. Um, so, people, music, what else? Art. Art, yeah. As a matter of fact, there's a whole uh, division of philosophy called aesthetics, where we study um, what makes things beautiful. Uh, what else? You know, taste. Animals. Yeah. Uh, people spend a lot of money on their animals, don't they? Getting them, you know, groomed and... You know, if you have a poodle, you got to get it shaved in certain ways and all that. Some people like chihuahuas, other people can't stand them. That's a matter of aesthetics. Right? Um, what about food? The entire realm of food, except insofar as it has to do with, you know, is it healthy for you, it has to do with aesthetics. Um, why do you pay more going to a restaurant, other than the fact that, you know, they want to make some money off it? What are you actually paying for when you go to a good restaurant? Paying for quality food. Paying for quality food of ingredients and then how it's prepared. But you're also paying for somebody to plate it for you. To plate it in an aesthetically pleasing way. Um, and you're also paying for the ambiance. That's why a uh, you know, $3 steak can cost you 50 bucks. Um, in some places. I, I don't eat in places like Unless somebody else is paying for it. Not, not all eat in places like that. Just do you know, research into aesthetics, right? Um, so you, you see the idea. That this covers a, a, a very wide range, right? What about moral judgments? When you hear the, the term moral, what are you thinking of? What's good and bad. What's good and bad. Ways people are raised. What did you say? Religion. Religion often, um, a, lot, a large part of religion consists in moral codes. You can think of the Ten Commandments, for example. Um, morality has to do with uh, right and wrong, or what's good and bad. And so if we have taste over here, let's just say right and wrong, and understand by that too. Right and wrong, or good in a full sense. Right? So if we say things like, uh, well, 
apparently, I, as I was driving in today, I heard, I heard about this um, show that aired recently that found that in North Carolina the, there was some, uh, some goings on with the crime labs and the prosecutors and some people have been sent to, to prison, uh, kind of railroaded, you know, where the evidence was doctored. If we want to say that that's wrong, that's a moral judgment. That's not a matter of taste. We're not saying, well, they just didn't do it in an aesthetically pleasing way. You know, they did something wrong, right? And if we want to defend them and say, no, no, what they did was okay. They were putting away dangerous criminals, you know, who they had evidence on. That's also a moral judgment, isn't it? Um, anytime that you say that somebody's a good person or a bad person, and you're, you're talking about their character, you're, you're making a moral judgment. Uh, what else falls into the, the realm of morals? Discipline with children. What's up? Discipline with children. Yeah. Um, is it okay to spank your children or not? That's, a, that's an issue. That's a moral issue. And the response to that could be one of two different claims. Yes, it is okay to spank your, your child. Moral judgment. Notice this, what's the opposite of a moral judgment? Another moral judgment, right? What's the opposite of an aesthetic judgment? Another aesthetic judgment. Um, somebody might, you know. Somebody might miss the point when you're asking about spanking and saying, I think that spanking isn't a good thing because I don't like the sound that the children make when they're being spanked. <laughs> you know, um, that would be an aesthetic judgment. Wait a minute. You might say, well, I think you've missed the point. But there are people like that. There are people who turn uh, right and wrong into matters of taste. And there are also people on the other end, aren't there, who turn matters of taste they turn those into moral issues. And we feel differently and we work differently with these, these two things. Now in between is this, this realm of what we can call the practical. And the practical has to do with getting things done. Or you might say with um, accomplishing Our ends. So, spanking is good. Somebody might might say that, and what they mean is it's a useful technique for discipline. Right? They're not yet making a moral judgment. They're saying for, if you have this goal in mind, then then spanking is something that you'd want to do. Let me give you an example that would work for all of these. Uh, dealing with a certain topic, like housing, right? Um, we might say, well, let's start with the moral thing. Do you think there's any moral claims you can make about housing? You can make moral claims. They may not, may not be ones you agree with, but you don't have to make claims that you agree with in this class. You can test on all sorts of things. Was it like, you should, you should buy this house? You should buy this house? I think. That's well, that's probably a practical. Let's put that in there. Um, you should buy this house. And maybe the assumption is because it's a good house, it's well constructed. And, you know, what are your goals? Well, your goals are to um, have a roof over your head and to not be throwing your money away, you know, to build wealth, that sort of thing. That's a practical judgment. And when somebody says that to you, you can agree with them or disagree with them. And they can give reasons and, and you can give reasons, right? Um, why do we have a, a, um, uh, a secretary of, of housing and urban development that we send tax money to? Um, why do we have low-income housing? What's the basic idea behind that? It might be something practical. So those poor people don't, you know, revolt and, you know, burn all the rest of our houses down. That would just be practical, right? But I think there's something else behind that. So you can help people? Yeah. So there's a broad thing of helping people, and we're helping them in one particular way. We're saying that maybe we say something like this. Everybody... Should have 
decent housing. That's a moral claim, isn't it? I mean, you could you could dispute that. You could say, yeah, some people don't deserve decent housing. You know, somebody's a real scumbag. Maybe they should go out in the woods. You know, or uh, live under the bridges. There's people who live under the bridges in Fayetteville, right? You can you can see the uh, clothes and the, the belongings laid out sometimes if you walk through the parks. Right? So not everybody does have a house. Um, aesthetically. You could say, you know, here's, here's a, a line, by the way. You go to somebody's place and you really don't have anything to say to them. Um, this is a useful line that you can say. You have a lovely house. Very generic, isn't it? You know, it's not going to offend anybody. Um, now, if you, if you say the opposite, boy, your house is awful, you may, you may in fact, arouse some, some passions. Uh, but if you say to somebody, you have a lovely house, that can be a really great way of getting out of an argument, too, by the way. You know, you can change the subject. And then you can ask them about, where did you get this? This looks fascinating. Um, this is aesthetic. It has to do with, you know, taste. Um, what looks like a lovely house to you may not look like a lovely house to me. Uh, we have different views on that sort of stuff. Um, some people I know like a very cluttered house. You, know, you probably know people like that. They're always getting one more knick-knack to put in. You know, they have collections and things like that. Um, I, that doesn't really bother me that much. Drives my fiance nuts. She would like a house with as, as little uh, ornamentation as possible. She, so she's very attracted, for example, to Japanese um, aesthetics, where space is at a premium. Um, whether your, you know, whether your house incorporates elements of nature into it. Right? Some people can't stand nature. Other people love nature. Um, so these are these are aesthetic value judgments. Um, you could have all sorts of practical value judgments about a house. You should buy this house instead of this house. Um, now is a good time to get that mortgage. That's a practical value judgment. As long as you're saying good, should, ought, must in the sense of, of you know, moral obligation, um, you are dealing with a value judgment. And you notice it's, it's on this whole gradation. What's, what's the gradation? Whether it's purely individual, ultimately, or whether it's something that, if, it, if it's really true, it holds for everybody. Um, now, what your book talks about that's uh, kind of interesting in this respect is, um, you know, I'll read it to you. It says, um, there are different varieties of value judgments because we evaluate things on different kinds of scales. So, right, we, we talked about that. And then he says, um, we need to deal with one common misconception regarding value judgments. Many beginning critical thinking students make the mistake of thinking that people are free to accept whatever value judgment they please and that all value judgments are equally plausible. But now actually, you notice he's made two claims there, didn't he? So he starts out saying, we need to deal with one common misconception. There's two different common misconceptions built in there. Um, so people are free to accept whatever, whatever value judgments they, they want. Well, let's think about that. When it comes to aesthetic value judgments, um, is that true? Yeah. If you, know, if you like coffee, you can drink whatever kind of coffee you like. And you can say, I like this kind of coffee. I like Dunkin' Donuts coffee. No, Starbucks is better. You know, um, green bean, you know, local that we have downtown. Um, no, that one's better. Maybe you don't like coffee at all. Maybe you like sugar in your coffee or milk in your coffee or I've seen people put, you know, honey in their coffee or anything like that. That's, that's purely matters of taste. You know, whether you like, um, you know, whatever genre of music you like. I mean, the one that I actually personally like the most and it's, it's what I grew up with, the 1980s heavy metal. I don't expect that any of you share that taste. 
Uh, I'm always surprised when I see students come in wearing, you know, t-shirts for ACDC or Iron Maiden or things like that. Bands that were producing their, their best work before, before those students even were uh, born. Um, you don't have to share that taste. I don't need you to share that taste. Whatever it is that you like to listen to, you know, whether it's R&B, country, rap, you know, techno, that's okay. We can, you can, and you can change it tomorrow, and that's okay too. As a matter of fact, as college students, probably you ought to experiment. Now's the time to broaden your tastes. You know, you're, you're not going to get that much of a chance to do it once you get in the work world, unfortunately. Unless you work in the music world, then you do get a chance. Um, what about practical value judgments? What happens if you get those wrong? That's different than a static value. So let's say, we'll take the house one, right? You should buy this house. Um, what if you get that one wrong? What are some of the things that could happen to you? Yeah. Maybe, um, well, you know, a lot of people bought houses at the wrong time. Remember this talk about a housing bubble? When you have a bubble, um, what that is, is um, people are buying some sort of product, and then they're buying it basically so that with the expectation of selling it to somebody else, and that person is, is buying it with the expectation of selling it to somebody else. They're not actually planning on using it. Yeah, when they use the term flipping, that's what they mean. Although usually it also means you're going to put some work into it as well. Um, and sooner or later, bubbles always burst, because sooner or later somebody actually looks at the numbers and says, Wow, that house is not worth half a million bucks. I'm not buying it. And then it starts to cascade through the entire system, and then you know eventually values decline. Now, if somebody was telling you, you should buy a house right now at the middle of the bubble, that was a bad practical judgment. That one turned out to be erroneous. So are you completely free to accept whatever practical judgments you want? You're free, but there are consequences. You know, you can, if you want, you can take contrary positions. You know, if you want, if you hire a carpenter and you want to argue with your carpenter about the best way to do carpentry, which is a practical concern, you can do that if you want. And your house is going to look like, you know, something like out of Dr. Seuss. Um, all the angles all wrong. Um, you can argue with your plumber if you want to, or your mechanic. Now, mechanics, you got to watch, though, don't you? Because they always try to add a few things in. You know, your uh, is, is, is broken. It's going to cost you 400 bucks. There you, you, you what, what do you do there? You go and you get another practical judgment. You get another second opinion. Medicine is about practical judgments too. You know, people always want to, at first, argue with their doctors. You know, you need to exercise more and, and, and you know, quit eating all that, that fatty food. Nah, you know, I know better. Your doctor has made a practical judgment, and if you want to take a different practical judgment, you're perfectly free to do so, but reality may bite you. See, with aesthetics, it's subjective, isn't it? Reality is not going to bite you. I suppose it could in terms of looks, right? You know, if, you, if, you are, if you think that somebody is, is very, very attractive, and then you marry them, mm -hmm. and then you're stuck with them, and, and they, it turns out they're not very attractive, there's, there's a great old song that I, uh, I want to learn. It's called The Very Unfortunate Man. And in it, this guy brings this, this girl home. And um, how does it go? First she takes off her wig. <laughs> and then the verse goes, he was a very unfortunate, very unfortunate, very unfortunate man indeed. And you're like, well, that's not that bad. Uh, a lot of women wear wigs. Then she takes out her glass eye. Then she takes out her teeth. Then she takes off her false leg. And it just goes through about eight or nine verses of that sort of thing. So I suppose you could be wrong about aesthetic value judgments. Um, practical value judgments, now we're getting into the, the stuff where there are experts, aren't there? It's not just a matter of how you feel or anything like that. When it comes to moral value judgments, in, in one sense, yeah, you are free to think whatever you like. But there's no requirement that the rest of the world say that you're right or that it's okay for you to think so. Um, 
There are some people who have what we call personality disorders. Are any, any of you in psychology, sociology, crimi uh, criminal justice? Okay. So um, there's a document, a big thick book called the DSM. That's sort of the, uh, the Bible of, um, of uh, disorders. They're changing it too, by the way. DSM-5 is coming out. Huge controversy about that. Controversies about practical issues because they're taking out things like narcissistic personality disorder and they're not replacing it apparently with anything comparable, which is a problem because there's a lot of narcissists out there um, and we do want to diagnose them. If somebody has something like um, sociopathic personality disorder, they have some very, very different moral judgments than the rest of the world does. And, and they're wrong. See, it's possible to be right or wrong when it comes to moral judgments. If you cannot provide any sort of backing for why you think things are right and wrong, other than I feel they are, you're probably wrong. Um, if you, when you think about it, can't reason out why the things that you say one ought to do are good, there's probably something wrong with your value system. Um, this isn't one of those things where everybody is free to accept whatever they want. If you want to say that other, what other people do is wrong, if you want to claim, for example, that what the Nazis did in, in you know, killing uh, six million Jews and then turning, you know, using their bodies for, for spare parts uh, in a lot of cases, if you want to say that that's wrong, you have to be able to recognize that this is not a matter of feeling. That it's not just a matter of, well, I see it this way, you see it that way. We can meaningfully disagree, and we do. As a matter of fact, politics is all about this, this and this. What's the best way to get things done? What should we be getting done? A lot of people in elections mix it up with this. <clears throat> I like the way he looks. She sounds nice. That's not a reason to vote for somebody. Of course, if you ask voters, you know, at the polls, turns out a lot of them do make those sort of decisions. They have the best ideas for getting things done, but what ought to be done, that's a matter of moral judgments. We should, for, for example, if you think that we ought to make sure that affordable housing is available for, for everybody, that's a moral judgment. And you can defend that. Uh, you may not have the, the skills to be able to do it right at the drop of the hat right now, but, but guaranteed all of you actually have the aptitude to be able to defend your moral judgments. And if you want to live in a good society, you have to have people doing that. Um, when, you know, when Martin Luther King uh, said that you know, it was okay for him to break the law in this case, which is what a letter, to Birmingham, letter from a Birmingham jail is about, because um, what the authorities were doing was wrong. He was making a moral value judgment. If you want to say that he was a good guy, you have to recognize that some people are right about moral judgments and other people are wrong. Um, and he gives you an example here in the book. Um, the other thing that he talks about is um, mixing these up. And that's something that you do have to watch out for. Um, I, I, you know, I mentioned that some people will treat moral judgments as if they're just matters of taste, right? So that they'll tell you, uh, we've, we've mentioned this before, when you're having dinner with people, what shouldn't you talk about? There's three topics usually. Religion, politics, and... Yeah, and the, the third one varies depending on your family. Religion, why not religion? Well, religion has moral codes. So if somebody is, um, you know, a, a practicing and faithful Hindu, there are some things that they will not do that most Americans would, would have no problem with. Um, and there may be some obligations that they have, and they feel those to be moral obligations. If somebody's a Muslim, if somebody is a Christian, if somebody's a Jew, if somebody is convinced that, that religion is the worst thing in the world, that's a value judgment. There are atheists who 
are sort of, you know, laid back about it. Ah, I just don't believe, but you know, you believe what you want to. And then there are atheists who are crusaders, aren't there? I, I'll tell you a funny story uh, about a guy when I was um, in graduate school. I was working for the John Dewey Center. Uh, John Dewey, by the way, was an atheist. Um, and uh, I was doing research in the library for them. They would assign me topics, and I would go out and, and start doing you know, research and tracking things down. So I met the microfilm machine. You know, you guys all know that. You turn the dials and things go past. And there was an old guy standing next to me. And uh, he sneezed. Now what do you do when somebody sneezes? Right. Oh, you might say Gesundheit if you're from the Midwest because you know the German influence, which means good health. But yeah, usually we say bless you. And am, am I invoking God? In doing that, am I, you know, making a theological statement? Not really. It's more of a reflex reaction. Um, well, this guy got hot. He got really angry. He got in my face. So you got this, like, you know, 70-year-old man, little guy, got in my face, and he says, you know, who are you to bless me? I don't believe in your God, and uh, I don't want his blessings. And he, just, he went on for about, you know, a minute. And I said, you know, uh, first off, uh, it doesn't really matter whether you believe or not. If somebody wants to bless you, they can bless you. You know, that has nothing to do with your beliefs. Um, but second, why would you, you know, if you, if you don't believe, then I'm just saying blah, 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 right? And if, if you do believe, then wouldn't it be a good thing for me to bless you? He was somebody for whom, you know, uh, atheism had turned into something like a crusade. He was engaged in a, a moral value judgment, right? Strongly held. Very, very strongly held. So yeah, we're not supposed to talk about uh, religion, politics. Why not? Because politics, again, is about things where we can be right and wrong. It was just a matter of, you know, um, I remember when I was in kindergarten, we, we had those weekly readers. Do they still have those? And back then, it was, uh, this shows you how old I am, it was President uh, Ford versus Jimmy Carter. And the class voted for Jimmy Carter. Um, and do you know why we voted for him? No, no, we didn't even read any of the stuff. We just looked at their faces. Ford looked very old and tired. And Jimmy Carter looked, you know, like, like a nice guy and, and you know, kind of young and all that. So we were going by purely aesthetic um, criteria, you know. I've heard, I heard some people in the, in the recent, you know, the last presidential election, you know, I just like the way Obama looks. <laughs> That's not a reason to vote for anybody. John McCain looks crazy. That, I, that could be a, a aesthetic judgment. That might be a practical judgment, too, right? Um, you could be, you know, worried about traits that would have to do with somebody's ability to do the job. But really, if you're voting for somebody and you're voting on good grounds, you're, you're following out some moral value judgment. What are the two other things? So, you're not supposed to talk about politics, you're not supposed to talk about uh, religion, and the other two are what? Sometimes it's money. Money is all about practical judgments. You can be right or wrong about that. And people, you know, when you point out to somebody that they're wrong, how do they feel? What's that? Offended. Offended, yeah. Uh, should, you know, if they really, if they really have their head on right, they probably wouldn't be offended because you're doing them a favor. But they do get offended. Um, and then sex. And we have all sorts of feelings about sex, right? Some of them could be purely aesthetic. This person's attractive. This person isn't. A lot of them are moral, aren't they? This is right. This is wrong. You should do this. You shouldn't do this. Um, even we we have practical judgments about. You know, if you want to have a successful relationship with your partner, you should do this, this, and this. That could be true. That could be false. You know, if, if one of the things is if you want to have a successful relationship with your partner, you should cheat every once in a while. That's that's a, a bad practical judgment, right? That that one's probably wrong. You know. Now notice you can make erroneous moral or practical value judgments. Uh, whether it, you know, whether an aesthetic value judgment can be erroneous or not, probably not, right? Because it's a matter of taste. So there we would just say, I like, you know, who's a band that you guys like? Pick anybody. 
Modest Mouse. Yeah, because I like Def Leppard, so this won't work. Uh, Modest Mouse. I'm not, I'm not even sure who that is, but so Modest Mouse. She likes Modest Mouse. I like Iron Maiden. Um, Iron Maiden is, is better than, than, than Modest Mouse. Yeah, sure, I think that. That's an aesthetic value judgment. That's not incompatible with her thinking that Modest Mouse is better than Iron Maiden. I think that it's okay to um, put people in cages. You think it's not, right? I'm wrong. You're right. Moral value judgments, some people are right and some people are wrong. Okay, so that's where we'll end for today. Um, I'll see all of you on uh, Wednesday.